Uh, paying yourself now and in the future, both from the Networking Hub and Sure Plan. Um, let's get down to the really important thing. It's about paying yourself now. So really what I'm going to talk about is making sure that you're taking charge of what you're worth and that you get paid what you deserve. I mean, are you, not everybody's going to pay um, per hour, but they might have um, add-ons to fees for particular products or services they have. But really, are we charging enough for our services? For those that worry if they charge too much, they're afraid they mightn't have any clients. For those that charge too little, they're worried that you're going to, you know, you might work yourself to the bone and become really resentful over that process. Because to work, to charge too little means you have, you need more people. So you want to get that balance of so striking a balance that enables you to build that thriving business where you're helping people, but you're also compensated for it. So for me, I think there's three key pricing strategies um, that can help you to deploy those services in a strategic way at the right time and build a robust and lucrative business. So the first one is hourly billing. And I'll go through that. The second, retainer agreements. And third, uh, to uh, pro productize your services. So the first one is around hourly. This is probably the simplest way and I know it's it's one that's probably used by accountants and coaches and um, service legal people and the likes. But if you think about what I'm going to get to towards the end, and this is what's going to be really helpful for you, is understanding what you are actually worth. But for the moment, we're just going to focus on understanding how we bill. Um, so you might bill uh, for the hours that you work. It's a common code of practice. The only thing about this kind of billing is, or charging your clients, is that you have to keep a lot of records on charging, you know, what time you're working on your clients. I guess VAs would, would use this. For those in the room, I know Helen and Karen, uh, actually Jenny, maybe all of you, uh, though, sorry, um, and Catherine, you all have products, but also think about how much you'd have to to um, deliver in order to get what you want. But it's how you also quantify the time you put into jobs. How much time are you uh, editing photographs? How much time are you on the road to get to that photography session? How much time are you designing those AGM books or whatever it is? How much time are you putting into the research of your uh, financial products and delivering those? Because I know that you guys do an awful lot to, um, get the background for your clients. And then time is, is time you're spending. It's also researching. Jenny, I imagine all the time you get into creating your courses. Anne-Marie, while you are, you might be on a salary, nonetheless, time, what, what is it going on? Where is the value of the experience and the, and the value that you bring to um, your role? So, um, I think also with the hourly rate is it, it, it can cap your the number of hours you work and the client and some clients might be a little hesitant to pay high hourly rates. So this might be a rate people who start up are on and uh, we'd advise, I'd advise you to, to move on quickly, rapidly from that. The other is a retainer agreement. This is more, it's better to know that you've got something coming in each month that might be a flat fee for your services and you can kind of buy a little or a lot, whatever you, whatever package of retainer, you can um, have price predictability in, in the sense that they know what they're getting and they know what they're getting for that. And um, you know that you've got money coming into the bank every month because that's an agreement. So if you have a client that comes to you regularly and you kind of think they, um, like even Catherine, I'm thinking about you, it's, it's somebody that comes to you on a regular basis, you're like, why not spread your cost out over a year rather than pay uh, lump pieces um, every two months, four months, whatever it is. So yeah. it's a great way to um, create regular income, but also to ease out the billing for your clients. And it might in the long run save you both money and time. Um, you want to get uh, quite specific, though, about what access they have to your advice, to your services, to your products, because if that's not specific, they might overtake what, what you're offering them. So you need to get clear on that. Um, so from that one, I'd move on then to uh, 
this is the product to, um, to productize your service. So this is a way of creating um, offerings. Uh, Maeve, I know you would, might do a photo shoot and they get free images or they get, you have X amount of hours or X amount of photos for a particular product that you sell, something like that. Um, for the financial services, probably not so, well, I guess it is, there's products they buy. Life insurance, pension, uh, income, all of that. So they are products. But it wouldn't be good to kind of be able to um, quantify what they're getting for those um, and they can purchase what they want. So it's not a, um, you can buy as little or as much as you want. And I think this is a really good one because it's very transparent. People know what they're getting um, and you don't have concern of the, creeping into that time of adding more time but it'd be good to get that clear because when you involve research which is what Karen and Helen do and I, um, I think that you've got to be mindful of how they use that and how much that can, can take away from you and um, whatever about how you charge money or how you bill your clients one of the things this is where it's this is the important bit really I should have quickly gone through those other three it's really important to know what you're bringing, uh, what you're charging for. So when we say we're charging for our work, what does that include? I mean, I've just noted down a few things here that I would be mindful of. Research is one of them. I brought that up with you all. Keeping up to date by staying above trend in your education, in your, in your own line of industry. Uh, networking, you're networking to develop contacts and resources for clients for your building your business, whether you're speaking or presenting at events, whether you're retraining yourself, your accounting costs, your admin, yada, 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 right? You can see this. That is work. That gets put into your billing. You have to understand that it's not just that moment of time that people are, are paying for. They're paying for all of the work that goes into it and all of the, the education that you have to be where you are today. And let's not forget about our expenses because all of those expenses that have, have been um, invested into our business, technical fees um, for our education, whether we're part of memberships or associations, legal costs, insurance costs, banking, accounting, rent, like it is endless. I mean, even just recently, uh, as this business went online, I was quite shocked at the amount I'm paying for um, platform and apps. So those subscriptions to uh, MailChimp, Hootsuite, uh, Eventbrite, um, Facebook adverts, all of those things get wrapped in. And they have to be considered for your business. So it's really subscription fees. How many of us pay out on subscription fees? So all of that materials, they all have to be uh, considered. So you need to keep an eye on that. And let's not forget that we actually want to pay ourselves. We want to be paid. We want to have a good in income that allows us to pay for our bills, have some holidays and all, you know, just really have a life. This is my vision. This is where I see myself once the lockdown is over on a beach. I could slim down a little bit to fit in into that hat diameter now, but there's the image and the goal and the vision board. So this is where the fun begins. And I want you to grab a pen and paper because we want to do a sense check on whether we're charging enough for our time, experience and qualifications. But also, it'll be interesting, Emery, even from an employee perspective, what the value that that is that you're getting. So um, I want you to think about on the left hand side of this screen is the list of um, considerations. So the possible working days, I've calculated this as 52 weeks, five days a week, average 260 days of the year is what we can work, okay? Public holidays, I've based this on the Irish public holidays. So I think England has two less maybe, or one less, you get either eight or nine. Public holidays, like I said, uh, for uh, you, Jenny, that might be nine days. Personal holidays, maybe you want to take 20 days off. Maybe you want to take 30 days off. I just put it here on the average. Six days, again, this is average, three days people take, and particularly if you're working for yourself, it's less, uh, they, they tend to be less. So all of that calculates out at a working days of 232 a year. 
do you want to work seven hours a day? Now, if you're working eight and you're working nine, put in eight or nine, whatever the figure is, because you've got to be realistic as to your value. So that would calculate then, I've estimated on seven at 160, 1,624 hours per year, which is what you're going to work. How much do you want to earn a year? What's your end goal here um, in terms of take home revenue? Now, this includes your expenses and, you know, it'll cover all of those. It's not your salary. It's your take home. It's your revenue, I should say. Your take home or your sales? It's your sales. Sorry, it's your it? revenue. It's your sales. Okay. It's your sales. Sorry, haven't I got myself? No, no, confused. that's okay. So this will give you an estimate. If you break down the number of hours I've, I've used here at 61, and I've used the sterling, it should be 61 euros um, or pounds, whichever you're using, uh, an hour. But double that because we're not productive 100% of the time. We're only productive 50% of the time. So in this example, I'm saying that your hourly rate is worth 122 euros per hour. So if you were to charge out by the hour, that's what you would be charging. Yeah. If you're not working like that, it's knowledge for you to know how much you need to be earning a day, a week, a month. And how does that show up through your products? How many products do you need to sell? How many services do you need to sell? How many courses do you need to sell in order to meet that? So I'm going to move on to this one. And this is what's stopping you bringing your value into its true, you know, the, the right charge for what you should be um, uh, putting out there. You know, those who undercharge also tend to work very long hours every day and don't stop. And the drive to keep working without st stopping often kind of stems from that lack of confidence that what you're delivering is not enough. It's not really good enough. You want to be giving the best, the best, the best. And I've seen many, many times where people give more and more of their time for free that they don't charge for that time because they're like, well, it's after six or whatever it is. And I'm just, I'm doing it anyway because I'm at the computer or whatever the, the excuse is. But deep down, why is that? Why are they doing that? Are they afraid that they're not good enough or powerful enough to help the client in the time allotted? Or they're not, you know, letting the client know it's going to take more time. Or perhaps it's a, you know, a lack of understanding of, what you're delivering. So again, sometimes this takes practice. The more you work, you realize I need to be charging more for that, or I need to um, be clear and transparent on what I'm delivering for the client so they're aware. Maybe it's vagueness of, of what we're, we're delivering. Maybe it's the business driver. We're not sure if actually this is what we should be doing. Whatever the reason, it's, it's important to find out What's stopping you charging your true value? What's holding you back? Now, perhaps we can come to this after the recording if you want to share and maybe put into discussions and in smaller rooms how we can help and support each other if we are in a position where we want to charge, uh, charge more. Now, I will be thinking, making a few changes to help you develop uh, the, the rates you want and the, the income and the revenue you, you desire is to identify the process of how you work and what you're bringing to the table for your clients, along with those outcomes you deliver for the client, like make that very clear. Do an exhaustive competitive analysis and figure out how you're different and better than the competition. And if you're not better than the competition, take some steps to power up your offerings and become stronger and more effective in what you do. This is gonna sound weird. I'm gonna say stop relying on word of mouth as the only way to generate business. It's the best way and it's the more, um, it's the easier way in terms of selling because people buy people they like and trust and they'll trust the people that refer them. But you want to start the marketing and promotion of your business in a way that it'll grow exponentially outside the circle of influence. And um, so those of you who did the, um, uh, strategic and tactical course is about growing beyond that network that we have and really opening those up. Sorry, I shouldn't be complaining about the sun, but it really is in my eyes. Um, and, you know, develop deeper, stronger boundaries. Say no to outlandish requests. 
that you know that take your time and effort know what your time is worth and demand the respect for that and if we can't respect ourselves our clients aren't going to respect it get some help to build and strengthen your business find ways where you can get help in areas that you, that you might struggle with financial accounting marketing printing whatever it is va so that you can focus more on what you deliver as a business and uh, what you do fantastically well. I know that I'm not great with social media marketing. I outsource that because I'm not great at it. So I have to outsource it. And I'm going to say charge 20% more today. Just do it. Any new client you get, charge 20% more. And then with the clients you have, build it in maybe to January 2022. My rates will be going up or my you know, the, the costs will be going up on the, but you give them plenty of notice. So if you want work done, get it booked in now. If you want a photography session done, book it in now, but charge 20% more. And if you're not charging 20% more, I'm going to bring you back to that other slide and ask you why you're not charging more. What's stopping you getting those rates up? Okay, so the most important thing is to understand, like I said, what's holding you back because uh, and I know, Helen, you've done extensive work on this uh, with your coach. When we believe in ourselves and we believe we can, we are the best of what we do, those blocks are removed and we are able to move forward. So it's about taking a step towards overcoming the blocks and your business will grow when you grow and you'll finally be able to love the work you do rather than have it drowning you in time that shouldn't be taken away uh, from your personal time. So that is me done in a whiz tour. And um, I'm going to stop mine. And I did mine first was going to help you to understand what you have to play with. So in doing that calculation on that chart helps you understand what you get to play with. So Karen, I'm going to pass it over to you and um, you're, you're going to love her work. It's brilliant. Hopefully, anyway, so um, so I'm just going to talk through steps that you can take now to secure your financial future. So I'm going to give a quick intro to myself and Sean Plan, similar to what Siobhan did. Talk about the small steps, talk about curveballs that you may get along the way. And then we can have time for some questions afterwards, or you might discuss uh, some of what I've said maybe in, in the next breakout session afterwards as well. So a really quick intro to me um, from the UK originally, as probably you guys have guessed, um, and, and some of you know me, most of you know me already anyway. I grew up in London, went to college in Manchester, long, long time ago now at this stage. And over 20 years, I worked for three different life companies in the UK and Ireland. Um, I moved to Cork in 2004, 17 years ago almost. Um, have fought hard not to take up the accent, as you probably tell, you can tell I've still got my hybrid kind of English-Irish accent. Um, and shortly after I moved to Cork, I studied uh, to become a qualified financial advisor here in Ireland. I had done the UK equivalent, but obviously I had to, to go back and do more exams when I moved here because legislation is different. So I roll on um, about 12 and a half years after working for New Ireland Insurance for 12 years, I decided that I wanted to be more at the forefront of the financial advice process. Um, my previous roles within the life companies had always been looking after a panel of advisors and helping them with technical knowledge and um, just basically trying to get them to do business with the companies I was working for at the time. Um, and I wanted to be more at the forefront and actually sit down with people and, and go through their uh, financial planning with them. And I had the, the um, experience and the qualifications to do it. So I joined a wealth management company, CWM and Her Money, which some of you will know me from my previous life at those companies. Um, in 2017. At the same time, I went back to college again and I did the graduate diploma in financial planning with UCD, which led on to become a certified financial planner, which is actually an internationally recognized um, qualification. And it basically um, allows you to become more of a holistic financial planner so that you're looking at someone's finances in its entirety. And, and I suppose not trying to product sell, which is something I wanted to get away from. And you're, you're able to kind of look at their they're now, they're present and, and look into their future really as well and help them with it. And the continuation of graduate diploma and certified financial planner was to finish off during lockdown last year at the tail end of my master's that we were in the, the early parts of lockdown. So it was good timing to finish off and I have a master's in financial services now. And around two or three months after I finished that, I started Shoreplan. We just entered lockdown last year 
um, but I still took the, the brave step of starting uh, my own business because it's something I've been planning to do probably for about two years or so before that um, and have been gearing up so I've still went ahead and no regrets so far anyway um, a year on. So Shoreplan is a financial planning company with agencies with all the main product providers here in Ireland and so we're not tied to any one company so we can offer clients choice. Offices in Cork and Dublin, virtual meetings obviously at the moment but we'll hopefully be back in person again soon and advise on all areas, mortgages, financial protection, retirement planning, uh, long-term savings and investments and financial wellbeing workshops. So I'll do workshops for networks or um, groups of employees, for, say larger companies, etc. So moving on to the, the steps to, uh, to help you secure your, your uh, financial future. So there's four ladies that I'm going to introduce you to. So we've got Olivia, Sophie, Isabel and Paula. And they're all similar ages. They all look very similar apart from their hair colour. They all have similar incomes and similar lifestyles. But they all plan for the future differently. So we're going to talk through each of them and what they do. So Olivia is a bit of an ostrich, so we call her Ostrich Olivia. And she's not very good at her finances at all or planning ahead. She doesn't seek advice and she tends to live day to day and doesn't think about tomorrow. So that's literally burying her head in the sand and plowing on and just I suppose on that hamster wheel maybe if she's a business owner or something and just not thinking about uh, the small steps that she could do now to secure her financial future. So then we have Sensible Sophie. And Sensible Sophie likes saving and she saves into a bank deposit account. It could also be a credit union account. And we're gonna assume that Sophie saves 100 euro a month into her deposit account, but each year she increases that amount by 10%. So what I mean by that in year two, she's gonna be saving 110 each month, um, year three, 121 and so on. She'll increase by 10% every year. So in 20 years time, she could have, and I'm saying could, because obviously we don't know what the future holds in terms of um, interest rates. But if we just assume an average of 1% interest rate per annum, we're on almost zero at the moment. They will go up at some point in that 20 years. After growth taxes, which would be dirt tax for a, a savings account, she should have in the region of 79,500. Basically, if she was to start saving 100 euro a month, increase it by 10% every year, and then we'll assume a 1% on average interest rate. So I would assume it probably would go up from there, the interest rates, but at the moment we're on almost zero. So I can only kind of guess, uh, you know, an average over that time period. So then we move on to informed Isabel. So informed in Isabel likes investing and she invests every month into an investment policy. Now she invests exactly the same as what Sophie is saving each month, 100 euro, and then she increases every year by 10%, exactly the same as Sophie. In 20 years time, she could have well over 90,000. She could have probably closer to 95,000 after charges. I've taken charges off here and after growth taxes. And what I've assumed here is an average growth rate of 5% per annum. So what she's looking at here is she's looking at medium to high risk investment, investing each month 100 euro and then growing you know, that each year. Um, and she should have just around the 93, 94, 95,000 after 20 years. I'll just sidestep for a second. Um, if Isabel was a mother or a parent um, and she was actually saving for third level education, this is the type of policy that she'd be setting up. So I'm just gonna step away from the 20 years for a second and we'll, we'll go back into that. But in this exact type of policy, this is where parents should be thinking about saving for children's education. And if you've got a child, say just starting uh, primary school and so they've got about 13 years to go to college in 13 years time using the same assumptions then a fund of around 37,000 which would be enough um, in today's terms for a child to go three or four years in college this would be the type of plan that you'd be looking at as well so it's not just sort of saving for your, your own future you need to be thinking about saving for the next generation saving for your children's future as well so we're back to um, the 20 years and, and I'm going to introduce Paula. So Paula's more prudent than um, Sophie and Isabel because Paula likes pensions and she contributes to a pension instead of a savings plan or a saving into a bank account. So again back to the same thing, Paula contributes into a pension fund 100 euro a month increasing it by 
um, per annum. And in 20 years time, she could have a fund in the region of 182,000. Now that's over double uh, what informed Isabel has in her fund. What I've assumed here is that Paula is a 40% income taxpayer, higher rate taxpayer. And I've still assumed the same growth rate as I did with um, Isabel. So the same 5% growth rate on average per annum. And um, she should build up a fund around the 182,000. So she's not just availing of the tax relief, she's actually also availing of tax-free growth. And that's where the big difference is. There's no tax on, on the money she's building up and she's getting tax relief on her contributions. So while it's only costing her a hundred a month initially before the increases of the 10% start, she's actually able to pay 166 into her pension. And that's because of the tax relief. You're a 40% taxpayer, you'll get 40% tax relief on anything you pay into a pension. If you're a basic rate taxpayer, then it's 20% tax relief. So by benefiting from the tax free growth and the tax relief, she's almost double the final amount that Iswell has and over double the amount Sophie has. So at retirement, um, what Paula will be able to do with the 182 odd thousand, will get some of it ta back tax free as a lump sum, and then she'll start taking an income from that remaining fund for the rest of her life potentially. So why would you save for your retirement? Um, and why would you think about putting money in a pension? So the obvious thing is when we stop working, so does our income. And we all obviously do want to stop at some point. We're all living longer. So the average age for females is now 84. That's increasing each year, males 81. We're not going to be able to rely on the state pension. I think we all probably realize that at this stage. The state pension age has been reduced um, back down to 66, I'll say temporarily. That's only because of there is a bit of politics going on for Fianna Fáil to have a coalition there. So I think um, you know that was one of the agreements. It's going to be back up to 68 in the next couple of years, and it'll probably go up to 70 probably in, in some of our careers as well, if not higher than that, because the government simply can't sustain the uh, pensions at today's rate as we have an old an aging population. And the big one, I've just explained it in, in those figures, like the doubling of, of the money from an investment account into a pension um, account would be your tax relief, tax free growth, and getting some of it tax free at the other end. So that small step of 100 euro a month to start with, means you're going to get big rewards in your future. And I always say to people as well, and I'm sure Helen will say this to people when she's reviewing um, people's uh, finances as well. So many people have previous careers, you know, they have previous um, employments, whether it's abroad, whether it's here in Ireland. Don't ever forget about your other pensions as well. You know, it's all well and good to start a pension and have one going now, but the likelihood is there's probably some in the past as well. So always make sure that you get your financial advisor to review those often as well and, and make sure they're performing the way they should be. They all, at the end of the day, towards, you know, count towards your retirement goal. So just to recap, just to put it there in the figures. So if you do nothing and you're like the ostrich Olivia, then that's probably where you're gonna end up is, is with nothing. Sensible Sophie would be one step up to actually start putting that money in a bank account. Um, informed Isabel is investing it. So taking on some investment risk, which I'll talk about in a second. Well, Paul is going a step further by utilizing the tax relief that we're all um, entitled to. Anyone that has an income, whether it's a salary um, or whether they take income as a sole trader or a company director, you're entitled to income tax relief. If you pay income tax, you're entitled to the tax relief and then your pension fund will grow tax free as well. Now, I don't want to put down bank accounts altogether because bank accounts are exactly where you should put some of your money. And I always make sure, and I'm sure Helen does exactly the same thing, that all clients need a rainy day fund and they need to have enough money in a short-term savings account, um, which is in a bank deposit or a credit union deposit as well. So short-term savings being anything you need in the next five years. Rainy day funds, and we've probably all well and truly needed one in the last year, is that ideally if you have about six months income in a deposit account that you can draw on if there's any reason why you can't work or you can't get any income for whatever reason, that you have a rainy day fund and then you have your short-term savings um, for anything you need in the next five years. You know, whether you're changing a car, whether you're doing up the house or children are going to college in the next five years, we don't have the long term with them. Anything you need in the next five years, bank deposits are well and truly the place to be. But if you're looking longer term, like we just have been, and you're looking five to seven years plus, or 20 years as in my example, 
then you do need to look at investing um, and potentially putting money on a pension as well. And the reason being, you probably all remember maybe about 10, 11 years ago, interest rates were a lot higher, but they've been coming down and down and down. And that's why we do need to look at doing exactly what Sophie and Paula have done and take on some investment risk to be able to try and get more return than what you're going to get on deposit, more than what Sophie was getting. So investment risk, though, is probably a bit scary to some people. Um, if you don't take on investment risk, your problem is in inflation erosion. So your money is not going to keep up with inflation. Inflation. So obviously, as we get move on in time, um, it costs more to buy the same goods, you know, in 20 years time versus now. And we fail to achieve our objectives, our retirement objectives, as an example. But then if you take on too much risk, which can I trust me, I can see that happening sometimes with clients and you have to reel them back and say, no, you can't go into a, you know, a very high risk investment if they don't have the time frame to do it. You can lose capital, you can lose confidence. So that's where you need an advisor like myself or Helen to really sit down with and work out what is your risk tolerance, what's your time frame, and how much investment risk can you take on to be able to try and get that growth that both Sophie and Paula are getting, sorry, both Isabel and Paula are getting in their investments and their pensions. And the, the big question is, where do you invest? Um, and what it, I always say, and Helen will always say to her clients, is you diversify. And I'm not going to go into this today. It's probably a whole new presentation that I can go into another time on one-to-one -one with people. Um, and any financial advisor like myself or Helen would sit down and make sure that their clients' portfolios are well diversified, that you're in lots of different assets. So then I mentioned I was going to talk about curveballs. So the 20-year time frame that we were just looking at, that's great if you can put the 100 euro a month in every single month and increase it by the 10% as we were talking about. But we get curveballs. I know we just had kind of a big enough one in the last year and a half uh, with, with some people's income where they haven't had any or certainly haven't had what they were expecting with uh, the pandemic. But there are other um, things that can that can uh, come along the way that can stop our income um, for, for many different reasons. And we need to protect our largest asset. And our largest asset is our income. And, and Siobhan's gone through, you know, how we can calculate our income. But income that we take out of our businesses or our salaries that take, we take home if we're employed, literally holds everything, all the other bricks up there. And it's definitely the thing that will feed our retirement and our future. Um, and, and those figures that I was showing you earlier, you need to be able to protect your income along the way as well from any curveballs. So the curveballs that could come along would be illness and injury. Um, and I'm sure we could all think of people that have, you know, suffered illness or injury. It could be something that's not life-threatening, like a back injury that you have to, or breaking a leg or something you have to take time out of work. And it could be something a lot more serious. Um, and then death. If anyone has anyone financially dependent on them, then they need to, unfortunately, not a nice thing to think about, but they need to be able to protect their income for the future generation as well to make sure that that income will still um, be there for, for those um, financial dependents, those children, say, um, until they're grown up and they're no longer financially dependent. So I'm just going to talk about two particular products here, but there's a whole um, number of other products that um, could be talked about that would fit the bill with uh, protecting against illness and against death. And that's where a financial advisor like myself or Helen will come into the frame. Income protection is one I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to compare it because you can get tax relief very similar to you can with the pension. <coughs> Income protection will pay you an income if you can't work due to accident or sickness. So that could be, like I say, like a back injury, or it could be something a lot more serious uh, where you maybe have to take time out and have treatment or something. Um, and it's very similar to the pension. You can claim tax relief, whether you're an employee or whether you're a business owner, you can still claim tax relief. And then life cover is another thing that if you have someone financially dependent on you, is something you absolutely should consider if you don't already have that in place. Um, a lot of employers may put that in place for their employees and business owners can put it in place for themselves as well and there's tax relief on those premiums. So I'm just going to have a quick um, show how what I've just said with the pension and the income protection, how that would work for kind of three different types of people that we probably have in the room here. So I think some of you may be sole traders. I think we've got at least one employee here and we've got at least one company director. So I'll just have a quick run through how it would all work and hopefully I'm not going to go too deep into calculations here. But this is something that you would sit down with your accountant um, each year if you're a sole trader. And you would look at what your gross earnings or your revenue, your sales are, take off your business expenses, and then you've got your earnings before you pay your income tax. 
And I've calculated here with this particular person, they're going to have some um, income tax at 20%. And then when they go over the, the band, they're going to have some at 40%. So the total amount for this particular person, income tax wise, is 12,940. Um, so their income, their take home pay for that year is 37,000. So we have example number two, exactly the same situation, but they pay a pension contribution when their tax return is being done, or maybe they paid it monthly throughout the year and say that they pay premiums for income protection and life cover. So I've just assumed a thousand there, and that would be roughly around 80 euro a month for income protection and life cover if they put them both in place. So their earnings before tax is reduced. I mean, obviously they pay less tax. So they're paying 2,400 less income tax. Now the income after tax is going to reduce by 3,600. But that's because 5,000 has been invested in their pension and they've had income protection to the value of the thousand um, over the course of the year. So whilst their income protection is three, sorry, whilst their income is 3,600 less, 5,000 has gone into the pension and they've been able to have any protection against those life and um, the curveballs that we get with the life cover and the income protection. So that's the way it would work for a, a sole trader. And um, I'll move on to company directors. So in this instance, uh, the company can pay the contributions, whether it's pension contributions or premiums for life cover or income protection directly from the company bank account, not benefiting kind for the person that's benefiting from them. Treated as a company expense. So uh, not subject to corporation tax. And if you were to think of that 100 euro a month that we were diverting, um, say, into the pension each month, if you were a higher rate taxpayer and you were going to take that as a salary, you would effectively be paying about 52% in taxes for that 100 euro a month or whatever it is that you're going to take from the company because you're going to pay 40% income tax, 4% pure SI, and anything up to 8% USC. But if you don't divert that 100 euro or more, hopefully, because you, you do need to build up more in a pension, then you're going to effectively save yourself 52% in taxes. So that 100 euro is really only going to cost you 50, 48 going into the, the pension, if that makes sense to, to business owners there that would, you know, you, you've got a choice of do I take it as a salary? Do I divert it into the pension? And that's your decision. Um, but it will just show you how much tax you can save by putting it into a pension and not drawing it as a salary. Employees, I know we've got at least one here. Similar to sole traders, um, your benefit for your marginal rate of um, income tax relief, 20%, 40%, depending which you pay. You can contribute to your employer's pension scheme if there is one. And if that's the case, then it's fairly easy. You, you don't even notice your, your tax relief. It's, it's done at source and it's all done within your payslip. And if you're lucky enough to have an employer's scheme that they pay into, you might benefit also for, from contributions from them. But if there's no employer scheme, um, you can set up your own individual one. And what will happen is revenue will adjust your tax credits and bans. So you pay less tax each month. Or if you do do a tax return, maybe you have an investment property or for whatever reason you do a tax return, you can claim it all back at once. So you can either do it monthly and pay less tax each month if you're paying into a pension or income protection, or you can um, claim it back um, when you're doing your tax return for the previous year. That was a, hopefully it didn't go too fast, but that was a whistle top tour of, of how you can um, do small steps now to protect your future and financially um, add towards your future and protect any curveballs. So just to remind yourself, you do need to still put money in a bank account when it comes to your rainy day and your short term, but for your longer term and your pensions retirement, you need to really think of investments and trying to get your money to work a lot harder for you and especially to avail of the tax relief that you can get on pensions and, uh, and you know, your retirement planning. Protect against those curveballs and speak to an, a, your financial advisor, myself or Helen or any financial advisor, um, you know, to get advice where you need it. And in particular, the two areas that we've looked at, which is your long-term savings and pensions, you'll definitely need you know, advice there and help. And also the curveballs um, to protect your largest asset, just to, to make sure that's protected. I'll leave you again with the ladies so you can have a little think about which lady do you identify with yourself. So have a little think about that one. And, and hopefully you're all Paulers, but if you're not, if you're somewhere down with Olivia or, or Sophie, then maybe just reach out and get some financial advice at some stage. Thank you. Well done. 
Um, no. I'm going to stop the recording so we can ask questions and be a lot more um, freer to speak.